when everything went out, it, it was just lights out. Everything was black. It felt like I was standing there and the lights were out. I, I don't know what came over me, but I felt two hands come on my shoulders. You're not ready yet. And I was in the hospital bed. And to this day, I don't know whose hands was on me. But I like to... I like to believe it was either my uncle or my dad. Welcome back. And today we speak with Troy. Now, Troy's father started abusing alcohol when he was about 15 years old until it finally got the best of him at 38 years old. Now, Troy was 12 when his father passed. Um, the impact of alcohol addiction in Troy's younger life is undeniable. I have talked to Troy several times since this episode was recorded, and he tells me how much better he feels like he got so much off of his chest in this episode, dude. Um, the energy of the room changes from the beginning of this episode when he's very nervous and, and, and in and out of his feelings to having a pretty good smile and relaxing by the end of this episode, man. Viewer discretion is advised because some of it is definitely hard to watch, and it's hard to see, man. This is real stuff from real people, man. The effects of these addictions... And what they do to our children and what they do to us is is real. And that's what I want to get out there for everyone to see. So uh, if you could drop a like, share, just subscribe if you're not subscribed, man. All those things really help a small channel out, man. We're trying to get the word out there. These people come and bring their stories in. And um, I got so much respect for them being able to drop it, especially the way that Troy did today. Um, so sit back and relax, man. Strap in for this episode of Chopping It Up. Troy, my man, what's up, buddy? Not shit, folks. What's been going on with you, I mean, man? You see it, buddy. You see it. You know me, tattooing and fucking podcasting. I know you gave me some of my best ones. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. Everybody loves my hands. Hell yeah, that's what's up. I appreciate you coming in, man. It's early, right? What time is it? Like seven? Yeah, I know. I just got off a couple hours ago, man. I got Work off at night. five. Work at night? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So introduce yourself, man. Tell us a little bit about you. Like, you know, who are you? Where are you from? What's your age? I lived in Winchester my whole life. Um, I'm here to talk about my dad today, some of my some of my uses. I do okay. have a past of using. Okay. And I'm here just to clear it all out today, just to clean out my closet. Yeah. And honestly, who better to do it with than somebody I know, right? Right on. Right on my chair now. I don't know. There man. we go. It'll just make some noise. You're all good. Right. You're good. But yeah, man, for sure, because I knew your pops, bro. We were pretty tight. Uh, we had a little... A little shit when we were younger and we was kind of battling at each other. And then once we hooked up in jail and we spent time together, like, we fucking loved shit out he of each other. He spent time with both you and Steven in jail, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to ask you, too, while we was at backseat and I forgot to, I was going to get you to finish my stomach for me since he, he can't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was yeah, something I meant to that. ask you. Yeah, yeah, we definitely talked about that. All right. So, uh, like say, your pops was an alcoholic, right? Yeah, man, it, it, it got a pretty big hold of him, especially especially there at the end. But me being as young as I was, it kind of, I was more or less worried about how my guidance was going to go. Okay. Because my my uncle was just getting a life of his own started. He, he was about to have his son. his son. His son was actually born the day after my dad died. Okay. And... Like I said, I was more or less worried about where I was going from there because, you know, Ryan was off living his own life. Cohen was off living his own life. They were in their early 20s. so. And Ryan and Cohen, too? My cousins. Okay. And I got. Same age I, as you? No. Um, Ryan's our oldest cousin. Okay. And Cohen's the third oldest. Okay. But I got to tell you, man, if my dad ever had one twin. It was Ryan. Okay. Because I got to tell you, we were, um, the other day was my dad's birthday, actually turned 50. All right. So we went down to the cemetery, and Ryan's just one of them dudes. You, you don't, he doesn't get emotional. You know, he's always trying to make fun out of bad situations, but never seen somebody so emotional. And I just sat there and froze like, like, man, I don't even get like this as much as this guy does. And Over I Over your pops though. Is that your pops is yeah. great, right? Mm-hmm. And I wonder I wonder about that sometimes because my dad's been gone half my life. 
I'm 24 years old. He died when I was 12. Right. It's, it's weird. And it, it, it gets me to this day. I'll be, I'll be out with my friends or I'll be out with my family. I, to this day, I'm a grown man, 24 years old. And when I see a father and son or a, a father in any child, it gets to me because, you know, I missed out on that. Right. And, it, and it, it's sad for my mom, too, because my mom tried so hard. My bad, man. <laughs> nah, bro, that's what this is all but, about, um, man. It's like a therapy for you, brother. Get that tried, shit out. Oh, she tried so hard, man. And um, I don't know. I feel like... I feel like I just went wrong somewhere along the line. You know what I mean? Right. You feel like it's your fault somewhere, though? Like, you feel guilt over it, though, man. I don't think it's any of it's your fault. I mean, obviously it's not because, I mean, drinking's your own free will, mm -hmm. especially by the age, you know, it all gets started. But I just feel like I've tried to embody everything that my father ever was because... From the day my dad died, I told myself, don't let this motherfucker die. You make sure when people look at you, they're going to bring him up before they bring you up. And that's that's what people do. I, I, when we when we was at backseat that day for Steven's thing, mm -hmm. everybody that saw me, they didn't talk about me. They was bringing up my dad to me. That's what I want to hear. I People ain't going to forget about me because... You know, because of that, mm -hmm. I ain't worried about me. I don't want people to forget him, you know, because that motherfucker is a legend. Because let me tell you, I've, I've had people, I, I've been in stores and stuff, just out in public, hanging out, and people will just randomly come up to me. I've been hanging out in bars and stuff. People come up to me and start telling me stories, and I'm sitting here like, who the fuck is this guy? Mm -hmm. And they're telling me. Story after story after story like this. This fucking guy lived a hundred year lifetime in thirty eight years, mm -hmm. and I I think it's crazy because I feel like I was always I was a I was a nanny baby when I was a kid. I was always with my nanny if I wasn't with my mama, mm -hmm. and I when my dad was going through his hardest times in and out of jail, it more or less took so much out of me to be at home. And I, I feel bad because, you know, my mom always had to deal with that no matter what. She couldn't escape it like we could. And my sister, man, she really... Bailed me out, you could say. When my dad would, um, you know what drinking does. It brings out the worst in people sometimes. There was a couple times, you know, we, I feel like it was always when there was too many people around, you know. Something would always, something would happen sometimes. And I can remember one time we were over at my grandma's. And my grandma had this big cabinet in the back. She actually still has it back there in the same spot to this day. It haunts me. But I don't know who all was there, but he wound up out in the yard, drunk as piss. He was fist fighting somebody. He came inside on a fucking rampage. And I just remember Katie putting me in that cabinet and it just went silent. And... That's all I remember from that. But that alone tells me, like, you were ready to fucking die. You threw me in a fucking cabinet. Like, if somebody came through that, he, he could have pissed somebody off. They come through the door with a gun or something, anything. And I, I think about it sometimes because anything can happen, anything. But regardless what my father has ever done or regardless who thinks what or who says what it's my father you know and it's crazy because i actually how long ago was it now i think it was about two years ago now three three years ago i um 
OD'd, actually. I, I did some stupid things. I met some stupid people that I really wish I'd never met and did some really stupid things. And I up and took it upon myself to take a fucking eight ball and let the police know that that was it. And I popped a bunch of other fucking pills and next thing I knew I was in the back of an ambulance. So where did that all start there? Like, did you start using young? Did you start using? No, I, I've seen where when I started using, it was almost immediately I moved, I moved away from home for some time. I, I did some bad things. I was an angry motherfucker and I regret it. But when I came home, I couldn't, I couldn't find a sense of forgiveness from my family. So I just took it. <laughs> my bad. Bro, you're good, man. <laughs> you're good. I just took it upon myself to start using it, I guess, as a coping mechanism. Because that's what I see everybody else doing. So You felt like it numbed the pain and make you feel better, make you feel worse. It never did. It made me feel worse, but. I just enjoyed the high I got. You know, you enjoy the rush from the high. And the first person to show up was my mom. I was stuck in the hospital for three days. They thought I was crazy. So you overdosed, right? Using what? Coke, fentanyl? A combination of all that stuff? I took took Coke, and I know I was drinking, so I shouldn't have been taking pills. Mm -hmm. That probably didn't help me none. I had a couple tabs of Xanax on me. I took them. I got them off a stupid friend that I don't talk to anymore. And um, I popped them, and I, I took a bunch of... I, t- I dumped a bottle of sleeping pills, threw them all over the place, and I didn't feel like picking them up, so I just fell right in the floor with them, man. That was the last thing I remember was throwing a pill bottle in the floor. And then I was in the back of the ambulance. But when... When everything went out, it it was just lights out. Everything was black. It felt like I was standing there and the lights were out. I I don't know what came over me, but I felt two hands come on my shoulders. You're not ready yet. And I was in the hospital bed. And to this day, I don't know whose hands was on me. But I like to, I like to believe it was either my uncle or my dad. Because I got to tell you, man, my uncle did some cool things for us, too, while he was here. Take your time, bro. Yeah, Yeah, take your time. My uncle's a tough one because along, he, similar to my dad, he was... He was really the last father figure we had, you know? And um, I'll just never find it in me to understand what happened that day because it was it was my dad's birthday. It was in 2016. Um, him, and, him and the woman he was with at the time, mind you, they had done had his two kids who I'm grateful we get to see now, but I just really feel like he wouldn't have picked my dad's birthday over all days to do something like that. What did he do? Many people believe my uncle shot himself, but I personally believe that somebody else was there that day and shot my uncle. I don't know who, I accuse nobody, but I truly believe somebody shot my uncle. And it's it's crazy to think about because I got to get up. And <clears throat> my bad. I got to get up every morning and look at my grandma and she hasn't been the same since. It's her son. She's never going to be the same, but I don't like to think I've taken his spot, but I like to believe I've tried to fill it 
because it's what they need. And, um, but it was, my uncle gave me actually just, I think it was maybe two weeks before he died. Um, I had quit riding bikes and biking was something I was amazing at. I was, I was a demigod on a bike. Not, I wasn't as good as some of the other people got, God rest Will soul. He's not alive anymore. But I was a demigod on a bike and I had, I had quit again because I, I just got depressed and couldn't do it no more. I'll couldn't be find, damned. Couldn't I'll, find joy in it no more. Just I got stopped being fun. I stopped finding joy in um, a lot of things after my great grandma died. Hmm. It kind of killed me inside. And to this day, talking about it, it just kills me. But a lot of death in your family, bro. Especially in the last what 10, 12 years. Let me tell you, um, <clears throat> let me tell you who one of the most powerful people in my life is. And I I hope I hope she sees this and knows it. My Aunt Tracy, our <laughs> Our cousin Tyler, he had a seizure when he was asleep, when he was 13. <laughs> and it's it's crazy because she had Keese right before he died. She's um our Uncle Job's daughter, her and him and Tracy's daughter. And um <laughs> Right at the end of his life, he went through so much in just the last. <laughs> it's just so much death to deal with, you know? Yeah, man, it's terrible here, bro. Thank you. It's just so much death to deal with, and most of it just, what 13-year-old just dies in their sleep? Mm. Yeah, I remember that. And man. you, you wonder, that, you man. wonder how your life would be today, because I could tell you now. I, I, I don't believe I would have experienced anything I did if my father and my uncle were still around, you know. But I, I'm just grateful every day I get, to, uh, I get to live in both of their images, because. I get to take I get to take care of my mom and you know and then I look just like my father. You do. <laughs> oh, I know. People have looked at me from a distance and walked up to me at the bar thinking I was not knowing he'd been dead all them years. Right. That's another thing too. That's crazy. It's it's very seldom. And it hasn't happened in the past few years, but I have had people look at me from across the bar. I would catch them looking at me, and they would come up to me, and like they would talk to me as if they knew me 20 years ago. And I would just kind of roll along with it sometimes, but other times I would stop and I'd be like, you do realize you're talking about my dad, right? Right. You do know he was 30 years older than me dead serious mm -hmm. like but it it just seems like you know how everybody says that men are like men's feelings are different from women's they don't like to speak they don't like to tell they don't mm -hmm. I think it's I think it was that way with my uncle and I think that's why what happened happened if that's how it happened right I do believe that's why because my dad for the longest time was the same way and I kind of feared the same outcome towards the end and to be honest if anything I'm glad he didn't make it that far to make that decision right because there at the end, my dad was really connected with me. I slept, we had the hospital bed 
downstairs. You, you ever went to the well the house on Welltown? The big white one. He um in the bottom room where the stove was, there was two living rooms downstairs. Mom was in one and he was in the other in his hospital bed, and I slept in there with him. He'd be up all times in the night telling me to get up so I could go over there and talk to him. And I had never interacted with it, like on a personal level interacted with him so much in my life and it's it was so weird to me because like dude you're dying and you're worried about me no i get it i'm your son but like you're dying dude and i didn't know what to think of it so i just let him go and i'll i'll never forget the i'll never forget the day he died because my uncle was more tore up about it than me. And I don't know why. Because him and my uncle, their relationship was rocky. But if either one of them had a problem and needed some, needed any kind of help, no matter what it may be, they were there. But he he showed up to the school. I was I was in science class. He he showed up to the school. I I was almost positive when I came downstairs and he was crying like that. I was almost positive something had happened to Ma or something had happened to my mom or something because he was he was losing it in the lobby of the school. And me and my sister walk up to him and we like, What's what's going on, man? Like like we we knew what was going on. We knew our dad was dying, but he still had he still had a couple more months. Like, where did that go? And we get home, and there must be 70, 80 people standing in my yard. Must be. And I get there, and my uncle sat me down, and he talked to me. And I'll, I'll never forget that neither, because, and he did that. Because that would have killed me. And um, I'll, ne- I'll just never forget how tore up he was. And I don't know why. It I I find it crazy people can have such rocky relationships. Maybe that was it though, and, bro. Maybe some of the regret was there from the fighting. Do you think you had a chance to squash everything? Like cause Pops was on the bed for a while, brother had a chance to talk to him and settle things. And I honestly maybe? I honestly there was people in and out of our house for months. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing faces I hadn't seen since I was little little. And I remember, I remember seeing so many people just come in and sit down and talk to him while he was laying there sleeping. You couldn't tell whether he was conscious or not half the time, so you just had to talk and hope that he was listening to you. People would just come in and sit there and talk to him. My grandma, too, she was, that one really tore her up. You know Reba, that really tore her up. She, um... If it seems like every year it gets worse for her now because that was that was her youngest son. That was her youngest son. I I can understand that, but I just really don't want grandma to get to that depressed level. I uh, like people die every day. You can hold on to it or you can remember the good things. And let the bad part of it go. Mm-hmm. And that's what I try to do. I try to look at the the good things. I try not to... I just... So talk about some of the good things. I'll never forget this story Ryan always tells me about my dad. And I'll never forget it because we used to live in the house that was right smack next to our grandma. It's tore down now, unfortunately, but... We used to live right there. You could just go right out your door and you were at grandma's. And he told me that he was over there one night and dad made him a never ending sandwich. It was like a never ending baloney sandwich. Okay. Evidently, I've been told that my dad wasn't too big on weed. No, but he no, would, he <laughs> no, but he would he, smoke he, it. He could drink a half a gallon of fucking liquor and walk a straight line, but if he took one puff of weed, he's fucked up. <laughs> That's how I was when he was a kid, for sure. He never oh, Ryan used to this. tell me he'd get him all fucking high and he he wouldn't smoke with him for weeks at a time because he got him so high. And 
it's crazy because I remember, you know, couples fight, people fight. So mom and dad would fight on occasion. And when they would, on sometimes on very rare occasion, he would he would go stay at a hotel. And regardless what he did, regardless what she did, regardless what happened, we were always begging for him to come back. I remember always finding, telling mom, go to the hotel and get him. Go get him. We want him to come home. And in the end, looking back on it now, that sometimes wasn't the smartest idea, but it was good for us that both of our parents were together. Right. That's what we wanted to see. Because it, I don't know what it was when I was a kid, but it just felt like at all times the world was falling apart around me. And I don't know why. I just had so many mental issues as a kid that I never recovered from that they just don't make sense to me sometimes. I mean, you had chaos in the house too, though, right? Mom was pretty much the organizer. Pops' life was pretty chaotic from one minute to the next. My mom is the white Afini Shakur. She is a mama. She is anything you need her to be. I don't know how she made it through some of what she did. And I probably will never know. Because she probably doesn't even know. I'll just never understand it. She she went through so much. And only only for him to die in the end was really the nail in the coffin because it kind of felt like so any time after he died my mother would drink. She only drank on weekends and pretty much only still does. For the longest time after he died, every time I caught her with a beer, it would it would just be a fight. Mm. It was a fight, and I mean a fight. I would smack the beer out of her hand. I would take the beers from the fridge and smash them on the concrete outside, pour them down the sink. And you're still young at this point? How old are you then? I was 13. It was right. maybe a year after he died. We were just about to move out of the Welltown house. And so not quite understanding what the whole situation is, but I knowing was at, that that alcohol mm-hmm. was something that took your father. I was at the point where I thought if anybody so much as took a sip of alcohol around me, they were going to die. Right. Because you watched it kill him. You watched him drink his whole life, your whole life, and you watched him die from it. I remember him getting out of the hospital when he had cirrhosis of the liver. I seen him at Food Line in Sunnyside. It's been closed he for 20 years. He didn't look like years. himself, did he? Looked horrible. Looked horrible. He was shaking. He was sick as hell. He I said, remember. I just got out of the hospital. I was like, go home and tighten up, man. He went home. He seemed like he got well exactly for a minute. What, that's exactly what Chad was telling him because, oh, while, oh, Chad got me one day, man. He killed me with it. We were sitting, um, we were sitting down in his basement just bullshit and fucking around with every all his basement shit. He had a drum set and shit down there. He was just fucking off. Oh, he hit me with it, man. He was like, you remember when your dad was sick? I was like, I was like, I don't think I'll ever forget when my dad was sick. He was like, man, I'll never forget. He came to me and told me he got six months to live. I more or less, I didn't say anything, but I more or less looked at him. And the look on my face just said, like, why the fuck didn't I know he only had six months to live? Like, I'm, I'm your fuck. And then I looked back on it. I was too young. I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't need to know he was on a time limit. You couldn't even understand what as, was going as on. As far right? as I was concerned, he was gonna live forever when I was a kid. That's that's as far as any child needs to be concerned about their parents. They're gonna live forever. But <laughs> never is that way, is it? No, it definitely isn't, bro. My dad's been dead about four years, three, four years. It's crazy. He's been dead half my life. Mm-hmm. He died half my lifetime ago. And it's, like I said earlier, it's crazy to think about what the fuck would I be doing today? 
Yeah, man. For all I know, I could be a damn businessman somewhere. Yeah, uh, my kids lost their pet mother while I was in prison. My daughter was like six months, no, two years maybe, and my son was like seven. So, man, I know it shaped their life. You know what I mean? That's why I was interested to do this with you, with you because I, I know that there has to be things there you haven't spoke on, things there you haven't dealt with, things that you're confused about. One person, one person I try not to get to speak a lot is my, my grandma, Momo. On my mom's side. At this point, she's she's lost Nanny, Pappy, Tyler, her husband, Angie, my grandfather, and her son. I can't imagine what the fuck is on her mind half the time. Literally everything she started out this life with is gone. And she's outlived half the people she was not supposed to outlive. And to be honest, I pray she outlives me. She deserves it, because let me tell you, I thought it was pretty much the end for her altogether when my uncle died. He he took care of her. He was he was everything. Anything the family needed, he he was it. He was literally everything. And like I said, still to this day, I'm I'm not convinced my uncle shot himself. My uncle my uncle loved his guns too much. He wouldn't have turned it on himself. He loved his guns way ugh, way too much. Hmm. So this happened in 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 a, a hidden place like his house, grandma's house. Where did this happen? It happened. I had actually, and I feel so guilty about it because. I'm not necessarily placing blame on myself, but it was my dad's birthday, so I went and saw Grandma and made sure she was fine. But most days I come to believe that that was my mistake because I woke up at Malls that morning. I really don't think whatever went down that morning would have went down if I was there. And sometimes... Sometimes the guilt sets in, but then I look back on it and I'm like, regardless what would have happened, you were just a kid. There was, there would have been nothing you could do. And it makes me feel so bad because, like I said, when that guilt sits in, like, I'll be thinking about it sometimes because I try to... They they didn't even so much as investigate it or anything. So I'm I'm looking around and I'm I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, now how did all this happen? Where did all this start? And I can never figure it out. And I think that's for a reason. I I really I really think none of us were meant to figure out what happened that day because it it's probably so awful. But I I truly believe my uncle was murdered, by all means. There's there's just no way he would do that to them two boys or to us kids. He told us kids he was always gonna be there, and he was always there. He was there alone, like always. So somebody could have come in and got out, and nobody would have seen it. Evidently, when they were arguing, they were the only two there. But she actually started seeing another man. And like I said, nobody knows what transpired that day. All we know is that I'll never forget it. I was I was with Grandma. She asked me to go to Walmart with her. She told me she couldn't sit inside no more. It was going to kill her. So we went to Walmart. And... I'll never forget when we pulled in her driveway, there there must have been 20 people standing there, all from all side of the family. So I'm looking around, and I'm like, is this a family reunion from both sides or something? Mm-hmm. My mom pulled me to the side, looked right at me, and hit me with it. She told me my uncle had shot himself. And I, I looked at her. I, I was like, I was like, you're fucking lying to me. I was like... No, I was like, if anything, somebody shot him. That was your first thought, though, was like, he that would not do that. He wouldn't do that. Somebody, and still to this day, that's my thought. And and again, I don't know who. I'm not placing blame anywhere, but 
if somebody did do that, why? Like, why? If you wanted the woman, you could have just took her. But, I mean, come on, man. I, I, I'll, just, I'll just never be able to find it in myself to believe that. It just makes... Yeah, it's hard shit to deal with. Uh, it's definitely... I, I don't even... I mean, I know I've dealt with a little bit of death, bro, in my life. It's just a square little bit compared to you. And I'm fucking three times your age almost. So uh, dealing with all that shit has got to be hard. But think about it in a cer certain ways, too. Like, I feel like you're looking back at something in hindsight. You know what I mean? You always smash your finger, right? And wish that you could look back and not smash your finger. So now you can see things differently than what you've seen it then. That makes it so much easier for your guilt to set in, right? If I'd have done this, if I'd have done that, what if I'd have been here? All them thoughts is what makes you feel guilty. You couldn't do nothing. Yeah, man. like... It shit happened the way it happened, bro. That's the first it's thing. Not your fucking fault, period. Uh -huh. It's just not. That's the None first thing. Is. That's the first thing I ask myself every time is, what could I have done different? Every time I start thinking about how one of my family members died or when they died or how they died, could I could I have done something different? Right, could but you I realize have... you can't, right? You know that. You know in real, in in real life it, you can't, mm -hmm. bro. In the end of it all, you, I can't. You got to settle that shit in your heart, man, because you're carrying around a lot of shit, bro. A lot of shit you're carrying around, man, and it's not your fault. I know. It just makes me feel so bad because I feel like uh, I, I can tell you now if my uncle was here, things certainly would be different because I... I gotta tell you, life just life just seems like a, a struggle for my grandmother anymore. And you know what? I can't blame her. She done lost everything she had from from birth. And you really do feel bad when you think about it because this this person gave you your mom, gave you life. And there's nothing you can do about all these bad tidings yeah man there is nothing you can do about it and that's how life is everybody lives and everybody dies sometimes it's at six years old six months old sometimes it's at 106 it was it was it was another thing recently too because here recently here recently like i'll see friends that i haven't seen in a while and like, I'm talking, like, tight-ass friends. Like, I talk to them every day, but I don't see them every day. Mm -hmm. For for the past couple years, it just seems like every time I come back into contact with one of my old friends, they just, they just die. Because God rest his soul, Lil Dylan, he just died here in January, and... I'll be damned if two weeks earlier I didn't see him. And the first thing he told me when he saw me was keep my head up. Like, at first I thought he was drunk. And because we were, we, it was just, it was just out in public. Like it, it was at the sheets down off my house. He was like, keep your head up. I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, I see what you be posting on snap and all that. And I, I told him I was like, I was like, you know, just, it's life. It's how it goes. And I was like, we'll hope you never have to find out. And it's crazy that I said that because he actually died. And it just tore me up so bad inside because that was one of my youngest friends, like, Lil Dylan really introduced me to the fact that your youngest friend, even so much as your youngest friend can go at any time, like death is no game. But it just seems like, seems like all my friends are starting to die now. And I really just, I really don't you know how to, to go about age, that bro. either. Wait till you get to live and see as many people die as I have. And I feel like that's I can a only curse. Imagine. It's a blessing and a curse. 
Because it is a blessing, but it is a curse. It's a blessing to live that long, but it sucks to watch all your... Dude, I can't... I mean, it's unbelievable how many people I've seen die. And some of it natural causes, car wrecks, some of it's fentanyl and, and overdoses. But yeah, man, that's part of life. Uh, I don't know, man. You, you, you feel a lot deeper about that stuff than me. And I can just see it in you. For death, me, like, death just hits me in a in does. a different way. I there's no expectation from you. Of people nobody to die, in right? my family really started. Death started in my family really in 2012, because my grandfather he died in 2003. I can't remember him for the life of me, but my younger cousin, who was maybe a year old at the time remembers him like he saw him yesterday god rest his soul and then my pappy died in 2008 those were pretty spread out it's in 2012 when nanny and tyler died that was and then my dad died at the end of the year that was three and then it just kept going after that my uncle died and now we're here it's like every time you get a little it's like you're down, 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 and you start to heal a little bit, and then somebody smacks you with another death, and it's just like piling up. And it just makes no sense to me. It's never made sense to me. I've I've never even made it a thing to try and understand it because I know you never can. It just it's just a natural thing. Life and death are just natural things. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked back on that. Because while I was in the hospital after I OD'd, I really did have time to sit and think about shit. Like, what the fuck did you do to get yourself in here? What were you thinking? And for the longest time when I came home from the hospital, it really felt like everything had felt fell into place. Like, for the first time in a while, I'd felt like I have no fucking worry on my shoulders I'm going home. Everything's fine. And then it all just sets right back in the minute you the minute a thought crosses my mind about death, about mm -hmm. I'll be I'll be walking through the house, I'll look up see a picture and that'll be that. I'll have to go to my room and sit cuz I I I just never been able to deal with it. It's always been a thing with me. I cannot deal with death. How about doctors? You go to any doctors? You want any medications? I took medications when I was younger for a lot of my mental health issues, but. So you just talked about mental health issues a couple of times. Like I know your pops had a couple of mental health things going on too, right? I Yeah, he actually had many of the problems that I do now. Mm -hmm. One thing that really gets to me is the schizophrenia, hearing, the, hearing the, that spare little voice in the back of your head that's not yours. Like every time I go to make a decision, regardless what it is, I could go to pick I could go to pick up two pennies, which one's more shiny? Like it'll always be that voice in the back of my head like, oh no, go with this thing instead of this thing, or go with this instead of that. And it, it always second guessing your it drives decision. me nuts because it can be I can be standing there trying to make the simplest decision anybody can make and I'm sitting here fighting with my head trying to make a decision. I will stand there for 10 minutes trying to make the same decision. And it's ridiculous. Hmm. And the P the PTSD, that's a bad one too. That's another one he had pretty bad because of the shit he went through. I'm assuming that came from his prison time and stuff. But I can never get along with the PTSD either. I'm a, I don't I don't assume anybody does, but it kills me most days because I I remember when I got down to I remember like it was yesterday I remember when I got down to Maul's house after my uncle had passed. It just felt like death, and when I think about that, I can literally feel how mm -hmm. I was feeling right then and there, and it makes me sick to my stomach. Uh, I remember when Ty when when Tyler died, God rest his soul, Wayne was the one that found him, and here I am in the living room on the fucking Wii. I'll never forget. I haven't I haven't touched Mario Kart since the day he died. 
Never again did I play a Wii. Never again. But crazy how moments like that shape what you do, isn't it? It is because looking back on how the how he just he just died in his sleep. He just didn't wake up. I remember I'll never forget Wayne he walked right past me. I thought he was going to the bathroom and out of nowhere he just fucking screams. He lets it go. He lets it go like he just saw a bloody murder. And I knew that was it right then and there. Like in the back of my mind, I was like, there's no way the wrong, the wrong, per because Nanny was downstairs taking her lap. Like she was, they were expecting her to go anytime. I was like, there is no way somebody else is dying in this house. Mm -hmm. How did, what, what killed him? He, um, I think it's epi called epilepsy. Mm -hmm. It's when you have seizures and they can happen anytime, but they're more frequent in your sleep. He had had seizures for, from what I know, his entire life. And I guess it was just that one seizure. It, they, they had actually said that the seizure was so bad that his heart exploded. And that's crazy that something, Jesus. that's crazy that something neurological can make your heart explode. And to a 13 year old, like that's a strong heart. That's a, strong heart how yeah, does that even right. happen like stopping it sure but come on with that and i'll never forget because i was in the car with dad on the way to i was going to see nanny one last time i was on my way to see nanny one, one la i didn't even get to see her one last time before she died because that happened they didn't want any of the kids there when they were taking him out of there and i'll never forget it he got on the phone with my mom right before we left the house. And the look on his face when he picked up the phone just told me either he's going to kill somebody or somebody's already dead. And it's, it, it's crazy how at the time I could already tell what all these looks mean, what all mm -hmm. these signs mean. And the look on his face, he just immediately just went emotionless. Like his whole thing. Like everybody died in a split second. I'll never forget that look. And he just put me. He just put me in the car. He he was real quiet the whole way there. He he you couldn't even hear him breathing if you tried. And when we got there, there was already an ambulance. I was like, I was like, oh no, nanny died. I didn't get to see her, so I was freaking out. And then I see them wheel him out on a um stretcher i'm like I'm like what <laughs> like what's going on because this isn't the first time he'd had a seizure i was like okay he he had a seizure he's fine no they're wheeling him out on a stretcher giving him cpr and i'm i'm looking i'm like i'm like well, where's nanny and they they put me in the car before i i, I never got to see neither one of them one last time and it and that's another thing I get guilty about is the last time I saw him, I mean, given we were, we were only kids, we were only kids. I was 12. I was, I was actually 11. He was 13. The last thing we did was fight the night before he died. We fought. And that's, that's a point I try to make now. Like if say the family's hanging out at my house and we're arguing with before you leave, you are going to talk to me because if I don't see you tomorrow or you don't see me tomorrow, that's not going to be the last fucking thing I say to you or you say to me. Because let me tell you, that will, I personally believe that will always haunt me. The fact that that was the last thing we did was fight. The last thing I told him is that I wasn't coming back. Yeah. And the next time I came back, he was gone that next morning that that really taught me that you really don't treat the people close to you badly because it ends it ends badly for you in the end. 
because he's not in pain anymore and I'm stuck here dealing with it. And like I said, it will it will always haunt me that that happened. Yeah, absolutely. It, every 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 year, every time the year strikes that it happened, every every time I walk through the living room and look at the pictures, it it hits me. Out of, and it's out of nowhere too. Some days I'll look at it and walk right by it, think of a couple of things, and then go about my day. But other days, other days it'll just kill me. I'll have to lock myself up in my room. That'll just be that. So let me ask you this, man. Do you ever have any thoughts in your head that tells you you want to end it all? Does that ever pop into your head? When I OD'd, I, I tried to. That's kind of what that was about. And it's like fuck all this, man. I'm, I'm, I'm and I will, it. I will always regret that now because that's something that apparently took took my uncle, and they they wouldn't want that for me. They did, they sure didn't want it for him. They wouldn't want it for me. And every time I look back on that now, it it sucks because how fucking stupid could I have been, like. If I could go back in time now, I'd probably beat the shit out of myself before I could have even took the shit, to be honest. I would have just bust the door down and beat my own ass. So you end up in the hospital, you overdose, and then you get out, you're good. Like, how does your family respond to that? Where's where's the support? What are they saying to you? When I got home, my mom came and got me from the hospital. She took me home, and everybody had came after that like it wasn't long after that and ever since then this the support has been there like if i fucking need it i got it and if they need it they got it you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it 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 doesn't just go one way or the other it's going both ways but you know i just feel so i just feel so guilty about it sometimes because it's something that they had just went through a couple of years prior why the fuck would i be stupid enough to do that you know and like i said if i could have even so much as spoke to myself before doing that i would have just said why like why cuz i i'll never understand why i did that and but i do understand if If that is what transpired with my uncle, then I do understand how making you, how you feeling so low can make you want to do something. Because I fucking felt it. Like, I felt like I was below rock bottom. Right, like how could it get any worse than this? Yeah, that's what, that's That's virtually what I was telling myself, like how... Can it get any fucking worse than this? I might as well just... Just turn it off. I'm tired of watching. Just turn it off. You kind of feel like that's an end-all, be-all, man. But then on the other side of that, you have to think about who's left behind, right? Because it's a very selfish thing to do, isn't it? That was one of the last things that actually crossed my mind before the lights went out was, what are you doing? Now that it's too late. And like I said... If that's what happened to my uncle, that's probably what happened to him in, in his last mo- moments. And I, like I said, I hope not. But he probably was like, "What are you doing?" There goes that mower. Like, there's that lawnmower, bro. <laughs> I knew that motherfucker was gonna come today. What stories you got about my dad, man? Oh, bro, I tell you, one of the ones I wanted to tell you was uh, we made up monkey fucks together in jail. <laughs> what the hell is this? So you don't know what monkey fucks are? <clears throat> so we used to play cards all the time. We used to play casino. We would just me and him be sitting there bullshitting. Just me and him kicking it most of the time. And uh, we play casino, and it's you know whoever gets to eleven or whatever it is first wins. So it's only two hands every time. So every time we would bet monkey fucks, and monkey fucks like you put your hands in between your legs, you squat down and grab your ankles, and then you got to bounce up and down. <laughs> so it started out just doing monkey fucks to lose and then it was like okay now you got to do monkey fucks but you got to stand on the washer and dryer or you got to stand <laughs> on the table in the middle of the block and do the fucking monkey fucks you know what i mean and then we added <laughs> sound. so he's like now you got to do monkey fucks but you got to sound like a <laughs> want you to ah, ah, as you're doing it so yeah. it became a super embarrassing thing but 
me and him didn't give a fuck. We just liked to laugh. So we would sit yeah. there and play cards and then laugh at each other doing monkey fucks all over the block. Um, I also remember a time we went, <laughs> when I started tattooing, we went to a tattoo party down in, uh, it's like down by Tom's Brook. Steven and them. Uh, oh, your mama shit. was there. and uh, She uh, have a mullet at the time? I don't know. I was about to say, she always had that damn mullet. <laughs> <laughs> but we was there and I was tattooed, because they had a little parlor set up and they wasn't tattooing. I was tattooed on a couple of people. And some dude said something slick and he did, it, it wasn't even nothing serious, but he said something about your mom's. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just like, blah, 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 this is about your mom's. And nobody really took it hard. Tina didn't take it hard, but I seen your pop snap. As soon as it happened, oh, I seen him. As soon as I heard it, I looked at him, and I was like, "That is not good. He should not have said that." <laughs> and then that dude walked outside, and then I seen Troy get up to go outside, and I had my gloves on. I'm tattooing, so I took my gloves off and walked out there. And as soon as I walked out the door, pop! I seen him pop this motherfucker in the head, and <laughs> start cussing at him and talking. To, and the dude was so confused, like he had no. Fuse. What happened, bro? Like, what did I do? I didn't even say anything that bad. And I was like, Troy, really? Ain't it? He fuck you. He was pissed, but uh, that was probably one of the last times we hung out, man. Um, I also remember a couple of times that I came home when I first came home from prison. I had that little trailer over there in Maine. Oh, I remember we used to come there. I used to play UFC in the living room. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would yeah, I come home a couple of times and he'd be mowing my grass. Like him and your sister would be mowing my fucking grass when I got home from work, bro. <laughs> I'd be like, what are you doing, Troy? He's like, like oh, hey. we didn't have nothing to do, man. I had a lawnmower, some gas, and he'd mow the fucking grass. And <laughs> then we'd bullshit for a little bit. Oh, shit. Yeah, man. When we was younger, he was definitely way more wild when we was young. When we was in our, you know, 18s and 20s. Grandma used to tell me all the time um, when he went to Timber Ridge, he used to open up the hatch in the back of the bus and jump off the bus all the time when he was going up and down the road. He probably would. Like, how fucking crazy are he you, dude? Would. He definitely like, did I'm not surprised care. you didn't try to jump off the prison bus a couple of times. Yeah. But yeah, he lit. There was a spot right around the corner from us. We lived on a pecking, and it was a big party house. Three, three of us, four of us lived there. We always partied there. Right around the corner, there was some people that had that pool room. They had a garage and they had a pool table in there. But we didn't drink, so Troy and them be over there hanging out, and they'd all be drunk as shit on the corner, <laughs> and we'd be all at the house stoned as fuck down the street. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, there was a separation because we weren't drinkers, and then they always drank because they always drank and fight. They always wanted to get drunk and fight. That was never our thing, man. We like to we like to sit back and chill, smoke some weed, or whatever. I remember when um I remember when he used to, when we lived on Welltown. I had a bike with a with a cup holder in the, on the bottom bar. I used to I used to take it and fill it up. I used to get the get a book bag and put all the beer in it. He'd drink his beer. I'd come up and throw him the one out of the bike and just keep refilling it and going back. I'd do it for hours. And to be honest, even though I was just doing dumb shit, going back and forth, it was fucking fun. Because mm -hmm. I could... My dad was a fun motherfucker yeah, when he wanted to be. Remember those good moments, bro. I, I, would, I would... My suggestion would be to, to stop thinking about the bad shit and think about the good shit. Point out the good shit. It's just like all the negativity in your life. You know what I'm saying? We got to leave that shit behind, deal with it, but leave it behind and let's deal with the good shit. As soon as I said something to you, and you're going to see it in the edit, as soon as I said something to you about telling me the good shit, you started smiling. <laughs> as soon as I said that, bro. I mean, it brought tears to my eyes as soon as I said it. Because you, you, your your whole expression changed, the whole mood of the room changed. So I implore you to think about those things, man. Don't think about what you couldn't have done, what you could have done. I do be dwelling done. on that bad shit, yeah, man. man don't I do be that. Feel, I be feeling guilty about a lot of stuff, especially, especially like I said when it when it was so. Twenty twelve was rough, man. Twenty twelve was fucking rough. Not only did tracy lose her son but my mom lost her husband both that's I, I, that's probably to be honest they mom and tracy have always been tight but i feel like their bond got even strong it's crazy how death can yeah alter bonds whether Absolutely. it's good or bad because i gotta tell you for the longest time after my uncle died i think i think my I think my grandma was just angry at the world, which mm -hmm. is understandable because the slightest if if you so much as if you so much as flicked her, 
and she wasn't in the mood for it, she would have a fucking fit. Like, oh, you're giving me a headache, all this and that. Like, you were never like this. And what happened? And then, and then it yeah, sets in. Yeah, it can change it for a couple of different ways. So, like you said, uh, you make sure that you don't let someone get out of the room arguing or, or in a bad way like that. You know what I mean? That's going to shape what you do from now on because of that experience. Some people don't have that experience. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. like I'm not big on the I love yous. I'm, not, I'm just I, not I, big on I don't, it, I don't. I don't do... I'm not going to, like, it's not soft shit, but I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I just don't do the I'm just I not big on it, right? Now. And I also feel like, too, the more often we say something, the less meaning it has. Yeah, so like, if, it, I, if, if I just say you, love you all the time, yeah. like these influencers I see on there, like, love you guys. Bitch, you don't love nothing about me. You love the fact that I just watched your video. You don't fucking know me. You love me. the fact that I just made you a little bit of How money. How are you going to tell yeah. me that you love me? Like, I appreciate you. I'm glad you're here. I hope this, that, and the other. But love, it, it seems to me like it that's takes meaning. That's a very meaning. deep word. It takes meaning love from the it. word to me. And If I tell you I love yeah. you, that's you're my daughter, you're my girl, you're my mom, you're my son. You know what I'm saying? You're somebody that means something to me. Uh, I have friends that, of course, I love them, and I probably tell them that sometimes too, man, just because it's shit that dudes don't do. You hear two dudes talking about I love you, bro. Like, it's, like, weird. But it's fucking true. Like, just I don't, be a man and tell that motherfucker that I, you give I a fuck I don't look at my him. friends. I don't look at my friends and go, love you and all this right. shit. But my friends know if something ever goes down or you ever need any kind of fucking help, do not hesitate to call me because I will make it happen, mm -hmm. you know? And they all know that. And I got to tell you, speaking of which, another person who's had a massive influence on my life and doesn't probably doesn't even know it. My brother-in-law, his name's Josh. I've known him since I was about 15, 16 years old. I got to tell you, me and Josh been through hell and back. We got into trouble together. We ran from police together. We did, we did illegal shit. Anything you could think of, I've done it with you. And, it, and it's crazy because you wouldn't think somebody you met that young, look at him now. Now he's he's taking care of your nephew. He's, he's stepping up and being a father to your nephew. Not only is he your friend now, he's, that's your fucking brother, man. Mm -hmm. Like, and he does amazing with my nephew. It's crazy because... His real father was never around. He was around for maybe a year and poof, out the door, gone. I really did not see Trey ever accepting another man because of that, given given he does have the problems he has, but... And Trey's your nephew? Yes. Yes. But given he has the problems that he has, but... He's still very much, and I mean very much, he's probably smarter than me, to be honest. He's very much so conscious enough to know when people are good and bad to him. Mm -hmm. And when somebody, he has autism, so when somebody does something mean to him or somebody's around that he doesn't like, he will let you know. Right. You will know about it because either he'll tell you or he'll freak out. And... Every I've never once in the time that he's known Josh, I've never once known him to f start freaking out or run from him. I mean, on occasion he'll run from you, just want you to chase him. Mm -hmm. But I've never I've never once seen him anything negative towards Josh or Josh anything negative towards him. Well, you can always look at dogs and kids, man. How a dog or a kid looks at a person. Cause they're just they're gonna judge that person. The dog's barking it might be a shithead. If the kid's crying, it might be a shithead. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's it's crazy too because Josh has been through his fair share too. I think he's just about equal with me on the facing death scale. Like he's he's up there, like. And it's crazy because we we went through that shit together. Like, mm -hmm. did y'all ever talk about it? Y'all ever like? 
oh shit, each other shit. How shit me and josh talk about every every damn thing he knows damn well if he wants to talk about something he they live two trailer they they live two streets away from me he can walk right to my house he can drive to my house whenever he wants to i could walk to his house we um like i said we we talk just about every day we'll probably talk every day till the day we die that's that's one person i can safely say like you're not my blood but you are my right, blood right and my people like as of now my blood runs through your veins type shit uh, all right so look i'm gonna fucking bust if i don't get to take a piss soon so i got a couple <laughs> questions here i wrote down i want to uh see which ones are relevant you have the option to pass, man. So if any of them you don't want to answer, bro, just say that. Just right. be like, yo, I'll pass. And like I said, some of the stuff we might have already talked about. Um, so what was the hardest part about growing up with an alcoholic father? To be honest, the hardest part about it was... I mean, obviously, it was hard watching him, you know, die over time, like... I From thought alcohol, I always right? I always thought alcohol was just a drink. I didn't know it could fucking kill you. Hmm. And that's what taught it to me, but I got to say the hardest part about that was watching my mom do a lot of stuff by herself while he cuz it's not like it was intentional. Everybody faces their problems, and I got to tell you he had plenty. He had a lot on his plate and it make it makes you it makes you really think about it because like man this dude like my grandma told me he started he he been drinking since he was like 15 16 years old like that's i know him to be a pretty good drinker at 16 for sure i know like he's dude, like that's, 2 years older that's than a me. long time to be drinking man yeah. that's a long t- oh i'm sorry yeah. that's a long time yeah, it is, dude. It is. And it's terrible. Uh, my, my grandparents were alcoholics, bro. Um, my parents oh, used wow. to drop me off there. Both of them were very drunk. And I mean very drunk, falling down, like touching the, the, the wood stove and burning their hand to pieces in order not to fall type alcoholics. Holy so shit. So I grew up around that shit a lot, which is one reason I never touched alcohol until my 30s because I just I watched it destroy my grandfather. He died from it. He started at 13, died at 62. Oh, wow, 13. Yeah, I watched my grandmother one time fall from the kitchen, bro, and when she fell, her head bounced off the floor so hard, I thought she was dead. I thought she was dead. She just hit the floor, thump, and that was it. She did not move, but she was breathing. I didn't know what to do. I put a pillow under her head and covered her up. That's crazy. In the kitchen floor, and I went to bed. So I get it. Uh, Uh, I'll never forget when we lived on Welltown Road, the, on occasion, when dad, dad would get a little too drunk in the morning time, he'd have a couple too many as soon as he got out of bed. He'd come get in my bed and take my whole bed from me. I'd be laying all the way up against the wall, and he's got my whole mattress about to fall off the bed. That's how I woke <laughs> up some days, man. And like I said, that's another good thing that's about a good it. Memory, like, though, right? It's yeah, a funny good oh, memory. Yeah. Might, whether he's drunk or not, man, it's a good memory. Oh God! Stop texting me. But yeah. So let me ask you this: Uh, uh, so you're growing up in a household, dad's drinking and things like that. You have friends. You go to a friend's house. What did you think of their parents that didn't drink? Did you, you know, was there a big disconnect there? To be honest, I was more or less around it so much that when I wasn't around it, the world just felt different. Like where am I type Mm -hmm. shit? Like, why is nobody drinking? Why is nobody acting crazy? Why is nobody out in the yard doing anything stupid? You know, Um, I was always just so used to him getting drunk, going out there and setting a fire. We'd sit out there and burn shit all night. And it always just felt like a whole new world when nobody was drinking. That's crazy, right? Because I've always felt like uh, we all see our childhoods as one, our childhood as one way. I mean, you either grow up in in A, B, or C, mm-hmm. but A doesn't recognize C, C doesn't recognize B. 
until we get older and then we start to be able to compare mm -hmm. and say your childhood was this way and you start to weigh those things we don't know how to do that as a kid i just think it's different how yeah. it shapes our lives um that one right there this one you kind of already answered but uh do you feel like your dad's alcoholism shaped you using and if so how I think it did because the way I saw it at the time was probably a really stupid way of looking at it, but the way I saw it at the time was it runs in your blood. If you're going to do it, do it, which is stupid because now that I look at it, just because it runs in your blood, I tried to redefine I try to redefine what my father did. What my father did. So if I'm going to drink, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to die in the process. I'm going to drink to have fun. Hmm. And if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to go out here and be crazy, I'm not going to get arrested three times a week in the process. Mm -hmm. But so you felt like you were drawing lines in the sand that you weren't going to cross that he did. More or less, my mother was drawing lines because she was not about to allow me to die that young. And I thank her for that because she went through a lot after he died because everything was on her after that. She was alone. She had not nobody. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, she had the family, but you got two kids by yourself now. She did it, though, man. <laughs> Fuck it. yeah, she did it. She shout still does Tina. it. For some reason, she still yeah, does shout it. Shout out to Tina. I still go over there in the mornings and bullshit with her sometimes. We go over there for breakfast. She is a fucking trooper. <laughs> Absolutely. She is literally the general. Um. So you spoke about this one, kind of. You talked about being locked in the cupboard, but can you... It, uh, can you remember a specific situation growing up around all that alcohol and partying that, that scared you the most? I actually can. Um, you remember when we lived on Rest Church Road, right, with the big pool in the back? It had the big, the big old above-ground pool. I ever came there. Well, we lived out there for a while, and one night Ryan had came over to the house, him and his girlfriend at the time. He came over to our house, and him and Dad were sitting at the kitchen table drinking. We were in the living room, and out of nowhere, I look, I don't know how I remember this as well as I do, but it's exactly as I recall it. Out of nowhere, I just look to my right, and both Ryan and my dad are on the, on the floor wrestling like they got a hand grenade. And I thought they were just wrestling for a minute because I couldn't tell what was going And then the laundry room was immediately to my left, so... When I saw both of them fly into the laundry room and my dad pick up the leg to a fucking chair, I knew it was real. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? And it was just more or less having to hide. Like, immediately my first instinct right then, then, then and there was hide. Because you don't know who's drunk, you don't know who's been doing what, and you don't know what's going to happen. And you don't want to be caught in the crossfire of anything because I know neither one of them's going to do anything to me, but if I'm running in front of them trying to stop them, they're going to barrel through me trying to get to the other one. So my first instinct was always to hide. I spent a lot of time hiding. Hmm. So that was, and it was crazy because all over a little fist fight, about 30 cops showed up to my house. That was I I don't like police, but it's not because I just don't like... I don't like police because when I was a child, that shit scared me, seeing cops constantly. Right. Everywhere I fucking went, cops, cops, cops. <coughs> Everywhere. Yeah, it kind of pre, pre sets you up to I, I not like them. Like, every time you see them, you're scared. Every time you see them, it's a shitty situation. So then, naturally, when you see them... The, literally like, the, the last time I talked to a cop, of course, it had to be a rude one. It was actually over here on Valley Avenue at the Sheets. And um, 
I told him I was he asked me why I didn't like cops because I, I tell them the me the minute they approach me, I tell them I'm just going to let you know I do not like police, but I will I will cooperate. Mm-hmm. This guy asked me why I didn't like cops. And. In the back of my head, I'm like, because every fucking time I see you, something shitty's going on. Mm-hmm. And I looked at him and told him. I was like, you know, every time I ever see cops, it's something bad or something bad that the cop is doing anymore. Because here recently, you know, with all the racism and stuff going on, cops especially ain't liked right now. No, uh, and they're not. For the completely fact, different that, reasons, but too. But that's also the reason why they're not liked is because he can look you right in your fucking face and judge you because you say you don't like cops. I mean, well, how come he can't look at it and be like, yo, I wonder why this kid doesn't like cops? Did something happen in your childhood? Did a cop do something dirty to you? But instead, he's yeah. like, we're awesome and you're supposed to love us. Judging you. I just think that's ignorant. Like, if you don't like somebody, you don't like somebody. It don't matter if it's a cop or a judge or a fucking gas station attendant. Yeah, and just if because just I don't, don't like you them. don't mean I'm about to not cooperate with you. I mean, you're you're still a part of the law, you know? So tell me why you want to do this, man. Why did you want to come in here and share your story about this? I had a lot in my closet, man. I've had a lot in my closet for the past about 12 years. And it's just been stacking up and stacking up. I had to get it out somewhere, man. I hope this helps, bro. I hope it helps because I have a lot of people tell me when they get home, it's like a relief. You know what I'm saying? I know talking about shit's a relief, and I feel like you just went through a fucking... I honestly can't wait to watch it back, and right. and to be honest, you know what? It's actually something good to have when you're thinking bad things, because you can just go right yes. back on it and watch it and look at it. And, you're... and, bro, think about 20 years from now, when your kids can watch it. See what I mean? That's why I put yeah, the so date. Yeah, so they don't have to face the same That's things. That's why I put I the did. date and the name and everything right on the clapper because you're going to know the day it happened. It's going to have your name on it. It's going to be there as a record forever. Mm-hmm. I hope. You know what I mean? I want people to be able to look back on this shit when you're 60. Yeah. So how do you think your experience as the child of an alcoholic father shaped your life? And moving forward, like, how's it going to shape you as a parent? To be completely honest, you can't really be too lenient as a parent because, you know, if you're too hard on them, they're going to, that's a bad egg. You're going to turn them into a bad egg if you're too hard on them. But at the same time, it's more or less about sitting them down and explaining to them like, hey, look, you know, if you want an example of what happens if you drink too much, oh, I can give you one, but it just might hurt your feelings. And it's definitely going to hurt mine. You know what I mean? It's more or less just sitting down and talking to them like, hey, you can be here or you can be here in life. But, yeah, it's pretty much just more or less. That, 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 like I said, that's a lot thing a lot of people don't like to do is talk. And me being one of them, but I'm cleaning out my closet today, man. That's what's up. You got no choice. That's what's up, man. Yeah, so I feel like it's like there's certain things that, that shaped your childhood you feel like you missed out on, and you're probably going to be the one that's going to make sure you do those things for your kids. Like I said earlier, I think my life would have been a lot different if the people that hadn't passed on, if the people that passed on hadn't, it would have been a lot different for me. Like, I don't want my I don't want my kids to look back on their life when they're my age and be like, could I have done this different? Could I have done? I want my kids to look back on their life and be like, I did that shit. Fuck yeah. When they're my age, I want them to look back on their life and be like, oh, I fucking did that. And then, the biggest thing people do not latch onto anymore is keep moving forward. Me being one of them, I can't take my own advice, and Mm -hmm. it sucks. Mm -hmm. But you got to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's why the windshield's bigger than the rear view. I love Jelly Roll. Absolutely, (laughs) that's my that's my guy. I'm going in. I'm going September. You going this year? 
Honestly, I think my mom's probably gonna, so I'm gonna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I bought tickets just because my mom wanted to go, bro. She's in love with him, and she wanted to go last year, and I didn't take her. And this year, I was like, "For your birthday, here's Jelly Roll." Jelly tickets. Roll blowing yeah. up. Yeah, that's my guy, man. I love to, I love to get him on here because that dude's got some stories. You know what I mean? You'd be for sitting sure. here for a few hours. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would definitely uh, take the time to do that too. Okay. Uh, Pretty much, you've pretty much answered most of this stuff. Let me ask this, though. So, watching your dad use every day, did it make you respect him more, or did it make you feel... How did it make you feel watching him all that time? Watching him all that time made me feel bad, but, you know, it kind of just more or less... I watched it change him. Like... It's crazy how much a substance or, you know, a drug can change somebody, regardless what it may be. It's, it's crazy. Like, I've seen people turn into fucking walking zombies overnight, like literal zombies. Like, these people be laying on the ground, fizzing out and shit. And it got to the point where he was drinking so much and relying on it so much that it just kind of got normal to me. Like, reg- I knew that regardless whether I respected him or not, he was going to do it. I knew regardless whether, well, pretty much anybody respected he was going to do it. So at the end of the day, I was kind of more or less like, you know, I'm your son, you're stuck with me, I'm your dad, you're, and, um, well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're my dad, you're stuck yeah, with me, I yeah. Got you. yeah. But, more or less, I respect him regardless. He's my well, you daddy. You still got mad love for him. I mean, as soon as he you molded, came in, you can tell he, that. He molded me into what I am. He helped mold me into what I am today without even being here. Right. So, last question here. What was the most important lesson that you learned from growing up with an alcoholic father? Face your demons. Don't let your demons face you. Face your demons. Okay. Explain. Everybody's got demons. Our demons eat us alive if we don't face them. That's kind of what happened to him. He just let the drink get a hold of him and it never wore off. So face your demons. Mm. Because I guarantee you if he did even so much as something like AA or you know, like medications or something. Fight your demons. That's Don't the only thing it. you can do. You can't. You can't sit there and let them let them get you, and you can't. You can't just stand by and do nothing either. So you gotta fight your demons. Oh yeah, yeah, man. He definitely had his demons. I I've, I've been clean for three years. I've been clean for three years off any any of that hard shit. I don't do none of that hard shit no more. That's good, man. You got to, if you don't fight your demons, you won't get nowhere. All you're doing is numbing something and just putting it off for another day. That's all I was doing for so long. All right, so look, man, I appreciate you coming. Like, let's drop a couple links. Where can people find you? Uh, You got a Facebook and stuff, right? Yeah. Snapchat? Uh, At The Real Stick. Okay. You know how I spell the T-H-A, At The Mm -hmm. Real Stick. And... My Instagram is the real notorious, T H A again, and that's about it. Right, and then Troy Allen on Facebook. Yes, sir. Right. So yeah, man, I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you making the time. Like you just anytime, reached out yesterday, anytime. we made this happen pretty quickly. I'll do it anytime. I got stories to go right for. On. That's what's up. So look, man, Troy kept it real. Like this is the first time we've had to break out the tissue box, man, because he he got all the way in there, man. So drop a like, man. drop a comment, contact this man, let him know how this 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 episode here made y'all feel, man. Because I feel like this is a great one for the kids. Uh, you know, you went through some shit as a child, man, and it shaped your life for sure, bro. I'm glad to see you doing good. I'm glad to see you clean. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, I just got to keep going, man. Keep moving forward. Keep fighting your demons. Right. Keep moving forward. That's right. That's it, man. What's your final message for everybody out there? 
keep moving forward. Do yeah. not look back. The wind, the windshield is bigger than the rear view for a reason. Hell yeah. Let's go. All right, man. Thanks a lot, y'all. Appreciate y'all watching. Oh, dude, if I don't fucking piss, I'm going to fucking <laughs> die. Swear to God.